folks, welcome back to another Throat Punch Lunch. We are currently in Essen, Germany for the Spiel 2017. So this was recorded a little bit beforehand, but we uh, wanted to keep the show going, you know what I'm saying? So we, we uh, got together, all of my contributors did a great job in uh, getting their segments in a little bit before time, uh, just so that we could make sure we had a show that I would be able to edit and put up for you guys before I left. Uh, a few days ago. Anyway, uh, I have a whole lot of good segments for you. A couple of new segments that are in here, so hopefully uh, you'll enjoy those as well. As always, we want you guys to put those comments in the section below, letting us know how we're doing. Hopefully you're enjoying everything you see. I'm really enjoying everything that my segment, my, my segment contributors send me, so I hope you do too. But hey, without further ado, let's get to all those segments. <laughs> On your turn, take what you can get in this game of Dungeon Pass. I am the one that is always in flight, glad to play with my magic bite. I am the one with no limbs and no hair, eating those plants and pooping everywhere. This is Dungeon Pets, this is Dungeon Pets, Dungeon Pets, Dungeon Pets, Dungeon Pets, Dungeon Pets. Dungeon Pets. Turn, keep them fed, or your pets might end up sad and dead. On your turn, keep their anger down. Magic is another thing to keep in check. Don't let them get sick, or their life might end quick. Think on what you need to do and what you'll get. This is Dungeon Pets. Make your move, no regrets. Mace is blocked, no, well, that just sucks. Keep them home, keep your coop. They can play and clean up poop. Sing with your rep, you'll end up in first. Take what you can get, take what you can get. I want to play with my critters so sweet. It won't be mad when coming out to eat. I want to seize an angry beast. Can't have my pet yearning for a feast. I want a lot of stuff to fertilize. But I can't live with the monster's cries. This is Dungeon Pets, this is Dungeon Pets, Dungeon Pets, Dungeon Pets, Dungeon Pets, Dungeon Pets. Exhibit them well. Get your pets all ready to sell. Check your needs. Make sure you're set in this game of dungeon pets. On your turn, keep their anger down. Gotta make sure that you acquire that cage. Or if you need a potion, you can feed. So get everything and hope your pets don't run away. This is dungeon pets. Take what you can get. Watch the pets grow up or retire at the farm. What a treat! The stand got another need. Now we will have just enough to feed them. This is dungeon pets. This is dungeon pets. Dungeon pets. Dungeon pets. Dungeon pets. Dungeon pets. Turn, keep them fed, or your pets might end up sad and dead. Hey guys, it's Jay, and it's time to talk about your flare. On 15 pieces of flare, I'm going to show you guys some ways to spruce up that game room. The other day, the Dice Tower guys were playing Betrayal at Boulder's Gate Live, and Sam picked up a figurine of wondrous power, I think is what it was called. It was like a little ebony statue that fits in the palm of your hand, shaped like a fly. Well, I was thinking, I know Sam doesn't have 15 pieces of flair, and my buddy just bought me a wood carving set. So, I would try out that wood carving set, make Sam a fly, make him a piece of flair for his room so he can at least get closer to that 15 piece minimum. So, 
Let's check it out. For this project, I used a palm-sized 2x4, a permanent marker, a jigsaw with a wood blade, a wood carving set, an X-Acto knife, a rubber mallet. Well, I actually used two palm-sized 2x4s. To start, I'm going to draw onto a 2x4 an outline of a fly found on the wide, wide web. I put on some safety glasses, then I cut out the outline with the jigsaw. Then I draw on some more details onto the fly. I carve out the detail lines to try to distinguish each part of the fly. I also try rounding out all of the edges to make it look organic. I use the X-Acto knife to score the detail lines so my chisels make nice crisp cuts. Sometimes I would use the mallet with chisel to make deep cuts. Well, right here I break off one of its legs by doing it improperly. So I go ahead and make all the legs look that way. Eventually I get to the bottom and draw some detail lines on there. I use the mallet and chisel to make some deep cuts on both wings. Here I put it on its head to hit down on it with the chisel and mallet and completely break off a leg. Whoops! I think I can still make it work though. So back to the mallet and chisel to shape up those wings. And I broke a wing. That's fine. I'll just make the wings smaller. I'll just make both sides symmetrical. I get to the point where I can start shaping what is left of the legs with the chisel and mallet. And there goes its entire leg. Okay, let's give this another try. Back to the mallet and chisel, but this time I've learned my lesson. And the leg broke. And I just took a huge chunk out there. Let's clean up these wings. I give up. Well guys, there you have it. I'm very disappointed in myself. And now I have these two crappy wooden flies that people are gonna make fun of me for. I'm used to it. Anyways, I learned a little bit of stuff while I was trying to carve this wood. Number one, be in patience. And number two, if you're gonna try wood carving, you need proper wood. This uh, treated two by four just doesn't do a very good job. It breaks too easy and it's a little bit hard. You wanna use a softer wood like basswood something that'll carve easier and not break off on you. Anyways, I'm definitely going to give this another try someday down the road. Maybe send it to Sam. Heck, maybe I'll just send him a shiny rock instead in a 10-foot pole. Anyways, if you guys have any suggestions on games or ideas you'd like me to make into some flair, leave them in the comments below or shoot me a message on Facebook. Pique your interest. Anyways, don't forget guys, 15 pieces of flair is the bare minimum. Some people choose to do more, and we encourage that. Have fun, I almost everybody. forgot. I have a giveaway going on right now on my Facebook page. Go to Facebook, search Peak Your Interest. You'll see a post at the top of the page with instructions on how to win. You enter, and you'll have a chance to win a pretty decent flare package. So head on over there, enter, and hopefully you'll win. Have fun, everybody. This is Liz Davidson with Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to bring you another episode of Solo Thresh, a mere thresh gaming for those of us who like to play alone. Today I want to talk about a really fun steampunk lock picking game from Chip Theory Games called Trip Lock. Trip Lock is a game of memory and chip manipulation. In it, you're an expert lock pick of dubious character who must locate, swap, or even flip different locking mechanisms to create specific patterns. Trip Lock is a game for one to two players. In solo mode, it offers a storyline that presents you with increasingly difficult challenges. Your introductory challenge only involves getting mechanisms into the correct order and orientation. So in this case, I'd need to line up a gear, a padlock, and a code from left to right. That means I need to figure out where those mechanisms are and move them into position. The other aspect of the game is completing diagrams for points. Every round, you draw one or more diagram cards that challenge you to complete tasks in exchange for points or even actions. 
When you draw a diagram, you have to choose which task you want to complete, and you can't change it without taking a specific in-game action. In solo mode, diagrams add additional challenge, even as successive rooms work against you in increasingly diabolical ways. To take actions, you need to roll two dice, which give you several options, including flipping stacks, peeking at mechanisms, changing your diagrams, or acquiring new ones. Since the dice won't always roll your way, you can spend two dice to take any one action, and you can use various special skills to take extra actions or adjust the odds in your favor. Once you think that everything is arranged to your satisfaction, you can declare that you're going to try to pick a lock or complete a diagram. You then reveal the mechanisms in question. If you're right, congratulations. You either win some points or beat the room. If you're wrong, well, you either lose the challenge altogether or you're forced to toss away that diagram card you put so much work into. There are a lot of things to appreciate about Shiplock, but what's most exciting for me is the fact that there is already plenty of dedicated solo content with more on the way. So Triplock was originally designed as a, as a two-person game, but there's a solo scenario that comes in the box called The Station, and another that came with my Kickstarter called The Factory. And in November, there should be more on the way. So I feel really taken care of as a solo player, and that's something that I've come to love and respect about chip theory games generally. Triplock is also a great puzzle-solving game, so if you want to solve abstract problems, this is definitely the game for you. The one caveat I would have is that if you want a solo game to play while the TV is going on a work night or while, you know, um, your spouse or your roommates or your kids are running around the house, be careful because this is a game that makes you rely on your memory. So if you're constantly getting interrupted or distracted, it's going to be a lot harder for you to play. So it's a short game, but it's a game that requires a lot of your brain power to play well. Anyway, those are my thoughts on Triplock. I highly recommend that you give it a shot and happy gaming. Hey everyone, this is Tim Jeanette the Metal Meeple, and this is the Budget Card Game Breakdown. So for this week, I thought I'd do something slightly different. I know I talk about card games, and this is a card game, but it's one of my favorite social deduction type games, and that is Dead Last by Smirk and Dagger Games. Now, Dead Last is actually called a social collusion game because you're not actually trying to deduce anything. What you're trying to do is arbitrarily decide on who's going to die that round. So everybody's gonna get, let me show you here, everybody's gonna get a deck of cards that represents the colors of the game, each player gets a color standee. So on your deck, you're going to take out the ones that no one's playing. Now, those are going to be your voting cards. What you're trying to do is kill off everyone so you're the last person alive to claim these gold bars. You put four of these out. There were three, four, and five points, you can see. And what you're trying to do is collect 25 points worth of these cards. First person to do so is the winner. This game is for six to 12 players. And what you're going to do, when everybody gets all their stuff, you start the round. One person's gonna say, all right, begin. Everybody starts talking. You can say whatever you want. You can point, you can tap people. You can kind of flash cards in the hand. You can be like, hey, uh, you know, without saying anything, you just kind of show it to half the table. And the other half's like, what did he show you? You can text message, you can do whatever. You can point to colors on your shirt and just kind of eyeball somebody be like, hey, you may not want them to pick that color though, or you may, or sorry, you may want them to pick that color, but you're actually picking a different color. So there's a lot of lying, there's a lot of collusion, and the point is, you want to get everybody to pick at least the majority the same person. So once everybody has decided, or at least the person who owns the game has decided that you know it's time to, to vote, he's gonna say time to vote. Everybody puts a card down in front of them on who they're gonna pick to be eliminated this round and then you flip them over. First thing that's gonna happen is whoever got picked the majority is the person eliminated. So in this case, we've got three votes for red. Red is eliminated. Now, however, you want to be in the in crowd on this. So you can't just go random and try to kill people or whatever, or try to happily, you know, try, try to try, mistakenly pick the right person or whatever you wanna say it. So. If you're not in the in crowd, you're also eliminated. So in this case, Blue received some false information. He's gone. So did Teal. Teal thought Green was the person, right? Wrong. At that point, you have three people left. 
you're gonna pick up all your cards, you're gonna start voting again or doing the talking and then vote again. And you're gonna keep doing that until one person stands or two people stand. There is one thing that you can do, however, if you think you're being targeted. So let's stand these back up real quick. Red thinks that everyone's gonna pick him, but he's a little smarter than everybody else and he's gonna play this card instead. Each person has their own color, which has ambush written on it. And ambush is basically going to uh, save you. Uh, these two people still die because they didn't pick the majority, but now red is going to pick one of the three players that picked him to eliminate. Maybe orange was the player trying to talk everybody up, so he eliminates him instead. So now you got two people left, or three people left, you play another round. Let's say uh, red gets eliminated and green gets elim eliminated and it's just black in the end. Black would receive all four of these cards. The, le the second scenario would be if two people are alive, say black and green, they're gonna get these cards here called the final showdown. You get a reference card that tells you all the outcomes on the front and back, and you have three different cards here. You got share, grab and go, and steal. So. This is the classic prisoner's dilemma. Basically, if you pick share and the other person picks share, you're both gonna get two of those gold bars down here. If one person picks share and the other picks steel, the steel is gonna take all four. And the if both people take steel, then no one gets it except everybody else at the table gets one card off the top of the deck. On the back, if you grab and grow, you simply get one card, the other person gets three, three, or they get one if they played the same thing. And then you just keep doing that over and over until somebody collects 25 points. What's really cool about this is it's pretty much replaced the convention party game for me. This is the game I love to play at conventions. I know a lot of people play werewolf and stuff. This is something you can hop in and out. You don't really care. You just play whenever you're done. You count up the points and see who wins. It's not a game. I mean, you can play it to where you get 25 points and that person clearly wins. But typically, people are coming in and out at conventions and things like that. Man, this game is really fun. I really like it. I like the fact that it's just arbitrary. And normally I would not like that, but in this game it works extremely well, uh, especially I love playing this with 12 people. I've played it with tons of groups where we had 12, 11, 12 type uh, size. Six, seven, it's all right, but the more players you have, the, I think the better it gets. It's just obviously going to be a little bit longer if people start winning uh, here and there because, you know, one person has to get 25 points to win. So. Highly recommend this one if you uh, haven't heard of it or checked it out. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me at timjanette at gmail.com. Check me out on Twitter and social media at the handle below. Check out my podcast, Meeple Core. Until next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. I'm Max Lathrop, and welcome to Gaming Unplugged, where we cut the cable and we hit the table. Hey, what happened to my football game? Like me some board games? 
Hi guys, welcome to Gaming Unplugged. I'm Max Lathrop, and in this segment, we're gonna be talking about spooky games you could play with your friends this Halloween. I picked two games out this year, one that's family friendly and one that's not so family friendly. So let's get started. Let's start with the family friendly game. Now most of us grew up playing Clue, and some of us still play it. It's a great game to get around the table and play with your family. But for some of you guys looking for a little bit more, I recommend Mysterium. Mysterium is Clue on steroids. Mysterium is a cooperative game where each player takes on the role of a different psychic, and one player takes the role of the ghost of the person who was murdered. Now unlike Clue, Mysterium is a cooperative game, so all the players are working together to solve the crime. All players either win or lose together. Another difference between Mysterium and Clue is that instead of each player trying to find the same person, place, or thing, each player has their own person, place, or thing that the ghost is trying to get them to guess. And of course, one of the craziest things about the game is the fact that the uh, ghost can't speak at all. He can only use these abstract vision cards. It's almost like having a, the, the psychics are having a, a, a vision or a dream, and it's really abstract imagery that they have to pull the substance out of to try to figure out who did it. And so you basically have the ghost sitting there, silent, just trying to like flash them these crazy drawings of whatever it is. So I definitely recommend Mysterium. It's a lot of fun. If you like Clue, if you grew up on Clue, this is your step up. It, it definitely adds a lot more uh, meat and mechanics to the game. And um, the artwork is fantastic. I mean, it's just a lot of fun. Um, and I really enjoy it, whether it's Halloween or not. We usually pull this one out once in a while and play it because it's, it's awesome. Okay, and for the second game I chose, the one for the adults, I chose Dead of Winter. Now, this game is awesome, man. If you like Walking Dead, you like the zombie survival horror stuff, that is this in a box. I mean, it is really fun. Um, this game is also cooperative, uh, but in this game there is a betrayer uh, mechanic, a traitor mechanic, which uh, basically means that at random, one of the players might actually be a traitor, in which case their victory condition is going to basically be trying to make the whole team lose. Um, but he has to be very secretive about that because he can be exiled from the game. In Den of Winter, you have a colony uh, that you're trying to protect and fortify, and uh, there's always zombies coming in, and you're always using your turns to go out and try to uh, get resources from different locations. And so you might be going to the gas station, and then, oh my god, the tank's out of order, everything's out of order, everything's out of order, there's no gas, and you're not getting any gas, and you just wasted your entire turn. Or you go to a school to try to search for food or medicine, because you're, you're, your colony's starving and you need food, but instead of finding food, you end up finding another helpless survivor, which is just gonna take up more resources. But they might be cute. And the entire game is about traveling out from your colony and risking, because every time you leave the colony, you gotta roll the encounter die and you might get bit and just die right there. But this game is a lot of fun. Um, there's a lot of different uh, characters that you can play as, each with their own unique ability. Once again, I love that. I love any, I love having games where there's different characters with unique abilities. It's a lot of fun and it's a really good game. And so for this Halloween, I can't recommend enough. Dead of Winter, it's awesome. There's multiple, uh, there's an expansion out. This one is, is the, long, the Long Night. Um, expansion that I have, but just the base game itself is great, has tons of content in it, so uh, definitely check it out. Well, that's it for this segment. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I want to wish you all a happy Halloween. I want you to be safe, have fun, play some sweet games, and don't forget to follow me on all them socials so you can see more sweet content like this, and until then, we'll see you next time! Ow! Have you ever wondered what games you should keep or you should lose? Find out here at Purge Reviews. Hi, welcome to Purge Reviews where we take two games, we keep one, and we take the other one out of here and purge it. What? No, I'm doing a board game review. No. What, what do you mean what am I doing with all these baggies? These are for board games. Insert here makes a insert for Dead of Winter that I think is fantastic and it beats a lot of the other inserts, and I kinda wanna show it to you, at least in my mind. So here's my regular edition of, of Dead of Winter, the original game. You can see I put my instruction manuals on top, and my boards, I lay it right there. What I have here inside the expansion is the original game of Dead of Winter, everything that comes with it. You're gonna have two trays that come out with your chits that will be able to come out and be set aside on the table. Baggies, baggies, I don't 
don't need no stinking baggies. So you can utilize anywhere you want. Now this isn't anything you have to put together. This is all pre-assembled and it's really, really nice how he does this. So here are my chits all separated. I got my wounds and frostbites. I've got my noisemakers and I got my people who just want to eat my food but not do any of the work to get it. In the other tray, I've got my food. I got some markers and some eaten food and I have my barricades in this one. Now this is how I have chosen to organize it. I have my zombies over here, and the zombies don't really serve any purpose in the game, so they're all just kind of stacked in there. And I have my characters stacked in here. This is how I've chosen to do it. Um, so I can differentiate my zombies and my characters when I want them. This one also has a removable mark where I keep my dice in here, and I keep some of my tokens in here, my zombie tokens and whatnot that I want. You can see it's all very nicely put in there, and my dice in here together. Now I happen to like my cards to be stacked this way. All of the crisis cards, I normally put those in the center. Now I have the crossroads cards. I use the app for this game. I just find that it works a lot better. So whenever I can, so these crossword cards, they don't see much of the light of day. And the character cards, I normally just stick right in here so they can be accessible during the game. The exile cards for me do not get used very much. So I'll usually just put them here at the bottom. The secret cards, and the, I usually have those, and the betrayal cards I have facing the other way. So I have both the secret cards kind of put together. Now, the way I like to organize those is put those on top of the crossbow cards I keep in there with my different scenarios that I have. So I'll put those you know, on top of the exiles. I don't use those very much at all. Now, this section right here, I've used for all of my cards. On top, I have the starters and then each of the locations in here. And I have them organized by what they are. You can obviously see that. So I like to have those all in one big pile. So when I want to play the game, the game is kind of already set up for me. I can take my scenario. I can get the secret cards out of here. I don't, like I said, I don't use the crossroads. I have my crisis cards and my characters here as needed. And I have these that I can pop out right beside the board that I'll be playing with. And those slide right back in there. And these, I gotta admit, are super sturdy, guys. This foam core, I like it a lot better than the wooden. I, I don't have to put it together. It's all put together for me and it's all cut up. And these are fantastic. So this is the insert here by Robert Searing. Fantastic, fantastic way to utilize this game. I like it quite a bit. Thanks to insert here, I can organize my games without getting arrested. Hey folks, welcome back to another just missed it segment here on Throat Punch Lunch. This is a segment where I basically go through uh, from time to time, not every single episode of course has one of these, but from time to time we'll have a game or an expansion or some type of accessory or something in our hobby that just missed the mark of being just really, really cool. And so it's kind of a downer, but I might show you something that you say, Hey, that is pretty awesome. I'm gonna check that out. And that's kind of the two-pronged uh, reasoning for me doing this segment. Uh, something that just missed it for me might hit the mark for you. So there you have it. Uh, today, what we're looking at is this right here, Gateway Uprising from Simon Limited. Now, this is an interesting game because it is a deck builder. And it's also an area control game which is a pretty neat mechanism uh, mashup, so to speak. I was just talking to another guy the other day, and he was talking about how deck building is, uh, you know, it started out as that's the only mechanism that was in the game, right? Um, this We just build our own decks. We try to score as many points as we possibly can by using the cards that we're putting into our decks, and boom, 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 whoever has the most points wins. But now it's being married to another, you know, other me mechanisms in games. So it's being used as not the core mechanism, but it's just being used as one of the many mechanisms in a game. And this is one of those things that does that. It is really um, a deck builder, but there's other things that you're using your cards for throughout the course of the game. And so that's cool. That's what first brought this into the limelight for me, was this idea of using deck building, not as just a core me mechanism uh, or a main mechanism, but just one of the mechanisms that the game uses. And so I was really uh, looking forward to giving this a try. Got to try it at CMON Expo uh, way back when. And uh, then I've been playing it a, a few times 
times since we've got our review copy in as well. And I have to say that I really enjoy the game. It is, it is a fun deck builder, uh, much more fun than other deck builders that I've tried in the past. So I do want to say that first of all. But you might be saying, so why is it on this segment? Well, it's very simple. It just missed the mark of being great. And that and the reason is is because it, it just takes a little bit too long to play it. Now the box says that it's 60 minutes, one hour for a two to four player game. And you know, I was I was the the last time I played this, I was timing every round. You basically are going to be playing 13 rounds throughout the course of the game. And I was timing every round and every round was taking about six and a half to seven minutes. And so if you do the math there, that's more than 60 minutes. Now, there are some caveats. I was teaching the game, but all of the people that were at the table were pretty savvy into games. One guy, maybe not as much as the others, but he wasn't, he, he was definitely catching on and he caught on really fast to what was going on. So, oh, you know, that's, it's just a little bit too long for what it is. There were a couple other things that made it miss the mark. The area control mechanism really wasn't as strong or as, you know, uh, needful. You didn't need to participate in that as, as, I was hoping it would be. Um, the artwork, I, I really think the artwork is neat. It's pretty grotesque, but it's it's a neat style. It yeah. just went a little bit too long. It just missed the mark. It's good, just not great. You know what I'm saying? So it just missed the mark. Maybe though, it's gonna hit yours dead center. So uh, I'm gonna be reviewing this uh, here in the next couple of weeks pretty soon. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. And then maybe with the uh, instructional part of that, you'll see something, you're, you'll be like, oh no, I think I'm gonna like that more than Sam did. And that's great too. Anyway, just missed the mark, Gateway Uprising. It's good, it's just not great. So hey, let's get on to the rest of your lunch. Throat Punchies, I'm Forrest from Bowers Game Corner. I'm back again for three reasons where I do something vaguely related to the number three. And oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm so excited, I just can't hide it. I think I'm about to lose control, but I think I like it because Essen Spiel is almost here, baby. And this is my first time ever getting to go to Essen. I am super stoked, I'm super excited. I'm actually gonna be doing my next two segments on Essen's games and the games that are gonna be coming out at Essen. So this week, I'm gonna be talking about my top three games that I've actually had a chance to try and already review from Essen that I wholeheartedly recommend that you check out and buy if you're gonna be at Essen. And then next week, I'm gonna be focusing on the games I'm most excited about. I also wanna give you fair warning, I'm kind of cheating this time. I'm actually going to be talking about five games, but we're just going to do honorable mentions for two games. So the first honorable mention is Queen Domino from Blue Orange Games. This game is fantastic. If you like King Domino, but you want a little bit more gaminess, this is the game for you. Uh, they already did a Miami Dice on it, but I wholeheartedly agree. Fantastic game. The next honorable mention that I want to mention is Edge of Humanity, which once again, Sam already did a review on. He gave it a Dice Tower Seal of Excellence. I'm not going to go that far, but it's a fantastic deck builder. It really creates a great sense of dread. The theme doesn't come across as much as you would like it to, but the sense of dread really does come across. This game just slaps you in the face over and over and over again. And if you like games like that, this is a fantastic deck builder. I wholeheartedly recommend checking out. But let's talk about the three games that I really want to focus on, even though we kind of already did. So the first one is Battlefold from, uh, I, I have no idea who this is from. Uh, yeah, it's in, it's in, it's in Korean. Oh, Happy Ball Bob. Uh, so this is a folding game. Yes, you heard me right, a folding game where you are going to be racing, folding these cloths, trying to get various different symbols on these cloths so you'll be able to move your character and manipulate them around this board. And each of the characters is a little bit different. you got your mage, you got your, uh, your archer who's going to be able to shoot far away, and they each have their own little quirks. It's a really cool, stinking game. The kids in my class have absolutely loved it. I think it's a fantastic family game. I think it's a good game night game. And if you're into a game that has a little bit of a gimmick, Battlefold is a really cool game that I definitely Definitely can recommend. Easy to learn, easy to teach, very neat concept for a game. That's Battlefold, even though I will say I would look at that exclusively as a three and four player game. Continuing onward, oh yeah, I gotta do it. Scythe the Wind Gambit. And I know most people, you, you probably already know if you're gonna get this game, but if you are on the fence, Scythe the Wind Gambit is 
absolutely amazing and it makes Scythe a better game and I feel like this is going to be the expansion. I know they're releasing three expansions for Scythe. This is going to be the expansion that people say is the best of the three and the third one's not even out yet. And how this works is essentially this gives people new end game conditions, which I know a lot of people were clamoring for. But the thing that I really love, it's going to give you these giant airships that you'll be able to move around the board and either everybody's airship is going to have the same unique special ability which will change from game to game to game to game to game or everyone's going to have their own unique airship which will have a passive and kind of a, an aggressive special ability it is absolutely outstanding if you like Scythe this is a must own expansion simple as that I enjoyed the first expansion but this one completely blows it out of the water in my opinion Scythe the Wind Gambit absolutely outstanding but the game that I've enjoyed the most well I don't know if I should say that the absolute most exciting game I think that I have seen from Essence Feel is Blank from the Creativity Hub. And I know you're probably like, what? What? Two to six players, ages six plus, ten minutes, but hear me out on this one. This is a family legacy game. This is a children's legacy game in which each and every time you play the game, the game is going to slightly change as the winner of the game gets to write on a card. And they get to either create a new rule for the game, let me get back to that because I know you're thinking flux right now, or they get to modify a card that will have a different effect in the game. But here's the thing. It's not like Flux, because in Flux, the rules are always changing, and you have to keep track of everything. In this game, most of the time, you are going to have three fixed rules that will be up top, and you have to follow those rules. But the really unique aspect of this game is the fact that it even says on the back, you can make this a trivia game. You can make this a party game. You can make this a dexterity game. And what I mean by one of the rules might be like, every time you play a blue card, you have to slap the deck as fast as you can, or you have to, might, might have to, you know you know cover your ears as fast as you can and the last person to do that's going to have to draw a card and since this is an uno style game where you're trying to get rid of all your cards that's a really bad thing you can also make it a trivia game so every time you play a pink card you have to name a, a movie with brad pitt in it or something like that you can make up all the different rules and you actually physically write on each card and then that card goes into the game so each and every game will slightly change as the game gets modified by the new rules and the new cards it's an absolute outstanding concept and as a family game Game. This is an amazing family game that I wholeheartedly recommend. Kids in my class love it. I want to get one copy for my class and I want to get one copy for my family. This is a game that I'm going to have two copies. I'm going to have two copies for a very long time. That is blank from the Creativity Hub. If you're in the market for a family game and you think you can get a quick uno West game to the table, you know, quite frequently, maybe family get together or something like that, this is outstanding. But those are my five five, let's be honest, my five games that I'm super excited about from Essen Spiel. Also, if you're going to be in Essen, be sure to say hi. Maybe after the show hours, we can go grab a drink, go play a game, who knows. But I'm Forrest from Bowers Game Corner, and back to more Fruit Punch of Goodness. Hi, welcome to Board Game Opinions. My name is Jonathan Hicks. I'm Steve Rain. And I'm Mark Winslow. And today, our designer spotlight, we're focusing on Simone Luciani, who's done Zolkin, among other things, and also we're looking at... Lorenzo Il Magnifico, The Voyages of Marco Polo. Uh, now, Simone Luciani often collaborates with other designers, so actually each of these three games have been designed not just by Simone Luciani, but also others. But he's the common thread. It's not the other designers not the same, if you like, from game to game. So we thought we'd focus on him. Uh, Steve, do you want to talk about Lorenzo first? Yeah, it's the newest of the three games on uh, on the table at the moment. Uh, it is a sort of worker placement game, but your workers are controlled by dice. So basically, three of your four workers correspond to the three dice that will be trounced. So if the orange dice is a five, your orange workers are strength five, but so is everyone else's. That's quite a nice mechanism in that if you roll low on your turn and everyone else rolls high, you don't get worse action. So you correspond to that, uh, the same thing. And basically what you're doing is you're putting workers on the back, on the board to get cards and people and things to kind of power an engine that you're going to be build throughout the game. There's a faith track as well where uh, in every third of the game if you don't have enough faith in the church and you want to use that faith to demonstrate yeah we're loyal to you something bad happens to you but if you don't spend that faith and bad things happen to you at the end of the game you can score points for having quite a lot of faith. The punishments are quite severe. Yeah. Now, aren't they? You've got to, I think you've just got to pick and choose which punishments you're willing to take. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Zolkin's also a worker placement game but with a couple of interesting twists. Uh, the first is that when it's your turn you can either place workers down on actions or you take the workers back and get the actions. You can place as many workers as you like or take as many as you like uh, but that tension between do I place this round or do I take this round is often quite tricky. And the other thing that Zolkin's famous for really is the board itself which is made of these interlocking cog wheels. So the smaller wheels around the outside are where you place your workers and then each round, each turn you kind of turn the big wheel in the middle and all these 
outer wheels move and all the actions where you place your workers get better. So you kind of want to leave them there, wait for them to get better and better and better, and then withdraw them when you get really good actions. But sometimes you really need something. You're like, I need it now, I'd like to wait, but I desperately need the corn or whatever it is you're trying to get. Sometimes you'd like to wait and you haven't got any more workers to put down, yes. which means yeah. you have to take someone off. Yeah. Uh, essentially, you're gathering resources and cashing them for points, but some really nice mechanisms on this one. The Voyage of Marco Polo is a uh, dice placement, so another sort of worker placement, trading um, resource management game, but it's got two things that I find fantastic about it. The first is that with the spots, I think it is something that runs coming through his game, is that if somebody takes an action space, you can still go there, but it now starts costing you coins to do it, because you, for every pip you've got on your dice you place there, the more you have to pay for it, one coin for every pip. But it's important because the more pips on a dice, the better they are. So you're balancing how much can afford, looking about all the actions you're doing. The second thing, and which is even better, is the fact that everybody gets uh, like player powers, variable player powers, but it's really important in this because they're not like player powers in most Euro games or even Mario Thrash games. They are completely unbalanced in a great way. Everybody plays completely different. You have power envy throughout the whole game. You see people taking their action going, oh, I wish I had that all the time. Uh, and also gives you a, like a, a target. You've got to optimize that power to win the game. So every game you play is different if you're playing a different power. So like Mark said, it's a, they, they are slightly worker placement games, but if you want to take an action, generally, with a few exceptions, you should be able to do it. If you want to go on a certain wheel and someone else has gone there, you can still go there a bit further around at a higher cost. If you want to take the same action there, you pay a bit more money if you want to take the same towel on this one you have to pay coins to go where someone else has been so it's weird in a worker placement game to still be at access to some of the actions um, but just an increased cost so the order you take those actions if you haven't got the money you need to do certain things first yeah the other thing I really like about his designs generally is they're all so tight mm. so money's really tight in Marco Polo corn which you need to pay to place the workers is really tight in Zolkin you're often having to think very carefully about do I want to spend this resource here or not there's a lot to think about all right thanks very much for watching Weird Board Game Opinions. We'll see you next time. Yeah, right. Hey everybody, even Steven here. Today I'm going to show you my board game club in Erie PA for my students. I'm going to show you my collection for them and some tips for teaching games to students. Okay, first we're gonna go over shelf number one, which has some introductory for games that kids might recognize from their own homes or from seeing in the store. So we have some different games here like chess and checkers, also Blockus or Bloku, however you pronounce it. We have Dr. Eureka, Clue, Connect Four, Boggle. So these are some games that they might see and know the rules to already, so they can jump right in. Otherwise, we have some more introductory games that we can learn as a group, such as Rolling America, or quicks or over and under which are good because there's no player count we could play as a class so I can teach them rules and then we can go over them already and then we have some nice quick games like spot it sushi go we have a scrambling states game that can help them learn their states so some different light quick games for in those 10 to 15 minute situations we can get a nice game of kids and going together and now we're going to move on to my second shelf, which has some more advanced games and some more games to do with social studies, as I am a social studies teacher. So I have 10 days in the USA that can help kids learn order and also the states as well as they're progressing. We have some uh, historical topics like the American Revolution. We have Memoir 44 with World War II. We have Freedom, the Underground Railroad, and we also have the Making of the President. So these types of games will allow kids to immerse themselves in that time period and they can see some historical events, but also learning the rules and gameplay. And then we have some physic and logic games for kids like Circuit Maze, Rush Hour, Gravity Maze, and Laser Maze, where they have to think logically and use physics to help them uh, finish the challenge. So these are some good games to apply those skills, maybe that they learned from earlier, quicker games to produce uh, for those longer play sessions. Hey guys, now that you've seen my collection, let me give you five tips I have for teaching games to students. First thing is to remember it's all about the community. A lot of times when kids come to my classroom, they don't know each other, so this gives them an opportunity to make a new friend and help them learn something together. Number two, make sure you work from simple to complex games. Something that might be extremely easy for you might be on the middle scale for your students. So make sure you start off very simple and work your way towards their more complex games so you don't lose them along the way. 
Thirdly, make sure you encourage teaching. Once a student knows a game or maybe already knows a game in your collection, encourage them to teach others. A lot of times us teachers say there's no better way to show you know something than teaching someone else. Fourthly, repetition. A lot of times students want to move on from something from one game to the next. Encourage them to play it again. Learn the strategy. What can you have done differently next time? And the last one, engaging with the theme. With my historical games, I like to give them that background knowledge, get into the theme of the game. It will help them learn it easier, and they will also hopefully have more enjoyment out of it. Also guys, let me know in the comments, are there any games I should add to my school library? Also, do you have any other tips for teaching students games? Let me know, and we'll see you next time. Hi everyone, welcome to another Fruit Bunch Lunch and another episode of The Starting Tile, your first entry point for getting new players into our great hobby. Now today, most of my games that I suggest for gateway level tend to at least have some kind of theme or some kind of gimmick. This is a bit of a change. This one is a super dry Euro game called Imhotep. Came out last year around uh, the summertime for the UK Games Expo and it was a blast. You know, it took off really well and I think it even got nominated for the Spiel de Yaris. Didn't quite win it, but it certainly came close. But in Imhotep, very straightforward. You have a column of tiles and there'll be things like the pyramids, the tomb, the temple, whatever. And each one has a specific rule in how blocks, the, um, the square cubes, are placed on them. They'll be placed either in a row and then going up and up. They'll be placed in a pyramid fashion. They'll be just laid out in one big line or one big tower. And they'll score points at the end of the game or during the game or intermediately during the game. You know, there's uh, three different ways they'll score. And they'll do it at different times based on the tile. The tiles have got two sides if you want to make it more beginner friendly and more gamer, you know, gamer friendly. And the idea is, is that you have a little raft in front of you that you put the cubes on. You have to take them out of the quarry and put them on there first. And then from here, you get to put them on a selection of ships. And they range from having space for two, three, or four blocks. Um, I think there might be a five as well, I'm not sure. But what happens is that everybody will be putting the blocks on these ships. And then at some point, when they reach a certain limit, people can sail those ships off to one of those tiles to put the blocks on. Now, you can only get one ship per tile, and they unload in order from front to back. So the placement of your block is important, but also where it's going is important. You might load up a ship with all your blocks, thinking, yes, I'm gonna send this over to the pyramid and it'll be great and I'll get loads of points. Somebody though can come along and sail it for you because anybody can sail a ship when it reaches a limit, not just the person who has cubes in it. So you might have built this ship up full of cubes and somebody sends it over to the market and it's useless for you. It's definitely a mean game. I will warn you of this now. You are intentionally screwing up other players in this and they are doing the same to you. So if you're prone to anger or prone to sore losing, yeah, don't touch this because you will, you, it will just cause riots in your group. But if you like that sort of thing, then definitely give this one a shot. Yes, it has no theme. And to be, you know, for me, no theme is kind of like, oh my God, Luke, what's wrong with you? But you know, it plays two to four players, scales very well. It, you know, only takes about 45 to 60 minutes. You know, that it says 40 minutes on the box, but two players maybe, but four players, you're probably looking more at 60 minutes because you're going to take time to think. Some people might have to like, where am I going to send that? Where am I going to send that? Urgh. But it will make you think. This is not all pilot. If you just randomly sail ships to Lord knows where or just randomly put your cubes on various ships, you're going to lose because you need to be specific about where you want to put them. You know that the pyramid scores better if it's like, oh, but three blocks are going to come out there. Mine's the second one. That will score more than that person who went out first. Great. Um, or maybe I want to go to the marketplace and collect these cards, which give you more scoring opportunities, give you special abilities, give you like one-off bonuses, that kind of thing. You know, and they add a nice uh, sort of um, extra level to the game as well. Definitely one to consider, but just bear in mind, mean, no theme, maybe not for everybody. But you're going to have somebody who's like, I want to get into board games, but don't give me something that's too light, too fluffy. Show them this. <laughs> light and fluffy is not what this is. So 
Imhotep, Builder of Egypt by Cosmos. That's it for me, and if you like what you see, subscribe to the YouTube channel and the podcast. But for now, I'll let you go and enjoy some of these gateway games. Just remember, mean as old get out. Still only a game at the end of the day, so make sure you stay friends, okay? See you on the next Throat Punch Lunch, and take care. Have a nice day. So that is Throat Punch Lunch. Thanks again for joining us. We certainly appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to spend a little bit of time with us. And that's why we're doing this. We want to help you guys out in the hobby. We want to give you guys other things to think about. And we do want to entertain as we're going along that way. So thanks again so much to my contributors. Thank you so much for all the work you put into all of your segments. And we certainly hope that you will continue to do so in the distant future. Well, that's it from us this week for Throat Punch Lunch. We'll see you in a couple weeks for the next episode, which is where the flip side is. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.